Hey, um, you hear me okay? Is this working? Yeah. Good. Okay, I'd like you to turn, please, if you would, in your Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles. And we're, we've reached chapter 17 in our study of the Acts, and we're down to verse 16, Acts 17, verse 16. I'm going to read from verse 16 down to verse 23, uh, but I'm hoping that we'll even make greater progress than that. So beginning in verse 16, it begins this way. It says, now while Paul's waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a set forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Amen. Again, God bless that reading from his precious word. We're going to think uh, this morning about Paul and the pagan philosophers. So Paul is in Athens, of course. Uh, if you ever watch travelogues on YouTube, uh, Athens is one of those destinations. People like to go visit Athens. It's a center of culture, and it was in Paul's day as well. And so he has a chance to see Athens, of course. Part of the reason is he's waiting there for the arrival of his companions, uh, Silas and Timothy. And so uh, he has this opportunity. He's got a few days break in Athens. What's he going to do? Well, instead of being captivated by contemporary culture, he was nauseated by it. Interesting. Because we read here that uh, he was stirred in his spirit. His spirit stirred within him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And that's all he could see. Uh, wasn't the beautiful architecture and wasn't all the all he could see was the flagrant idolatry in the city of Athens. And it really bothered him. And so much so that he couldn't stay silent, watching them, praying to gods that have ears that cannot hear, that eyes that could not see. He just couldn't just sit there and keep quiet. It really stirred him. And of course, it stirred him just because these, these idols were dumb idols, but he also recognized that behind the idols were demons. First Corinthians 10, he says that things that the Gentiles worship, actually they're worshiping demons behind these idols of these fallen evil spirits. We've been talking a little bit about them on Wednesday night. And idolatry is, is behind it. It's not just human superstition. In fact, we'll talk about the word superstition in a minute. But behind it is this demonic deception. Getting people to pray to things that cannot answer at the cost of ignoring the God who alone can answer. That's demonic deception of it, the highest order. So verse 17, it says, 
therefore disputed he. Notice the word therefore. As uh, uh, in the light of the fact that his spirit is stirred within him, so he does something about it. Therefore, he disputes in the, with, in the synagogue with the Jews. Well, that's business as usual. We know that. As we travel through Acts, he always starts there. So that's not a new thing. But not only is he in the synagogue with the Jews but with, and with devout persons, but he is in the market daily with them that met with him. So he goes into the marketplace. And in the context here, it's, it's not so much a marketplace where, you know, you buy your, your, your jalapenos and your, your kind of peaches or whatever. This is the marketplace of ideas. You see, in those days, they didn't have the World Wide Web. And so they had places where you came and disputed and discussed new concepts and new ideas. And, and one of those places was a place called the Oropagus. And, and, uh, and, and so he, he wanted to get in there and start discussing and disputing with these people. And so that's what he does. Verse 18, he tells us about certain philosophers. Now, we want to, maybe we should just pause and say, what do we mean by philosophers or philosophy? And uh, it's an interesting word. It's a, it's a, a word that's made up of two words. Uh, phileo, which is uh, used in, like Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's kind of affectionately fond of something. So, so these had an affectionate fondness of Sophia. Now, no, that's not a person. Uh, although sometimes people are called Sophia, but it, it means wisdom. And you say, well, that's commendable. Isn't it good to love wisdom? Book of Proverbs is a great book if you like wisdom, isn't it? This is not wisdom that is given from God. That wisdom we should love. Wisdom of divine revelation. This is wisdom of human understanding, right? This is human wisdom. And they love human wisdom. And of course, uh, this, this human wisdom was applied to try and get an answer to the meaning of life. That's what they were about. They were trying to define their world in a way that could give them some sense, sense of meaning. And so he talks about these different philosophies that were current uh, in Athens at that time. And so he says, there's certain philosophers, verse 18 of first group, the Epicureans, and then another group called the Stoics. Now, of course, these Epicureans and the Stoics, uh, they were followers of certain teachers. So Epicureans, well, that's easy. They were disciples of a man called Epicurus. That's why they're called Epicureans. However, uh, Stoics weren't following a guy called Stoic. Uh, they were actually disciples of a man called Zeno. But this man, Zeno, who actually was a Cypriot from Cyprus, uh, but uh, he lectured in Athens, and he had a place with a painted ceiling in Athens uh, that was known as the Stoica. And so followers of him were named after the place where they met, which is this painted ceiling kind of building called Stoica. And so they were called the Stoics. They followed Zeno. And uh, I would suggest to you today that unknowingly, many people in North America are still following Epicurus and Zeno. Now, you ask them, they would have a clue, even who these people were. But their philosophies, their view of how we look at our world, are actually still being understood and believed to this very hour. So I know you're curious to know about Epicureans. <laughs> uh, you want to know about who this guy is, these Epicureans. You want to know what they believe, and I'm glad you do. So, <clears throat> Epicurus is a person who says the whole purpose in life is the pursuit of happiness. Oh, wow. What were the writers of the Constitution thinking, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what America's all about, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> he was all about the pursuit of happiness. He says you're free to do just whatever you like, your own thing, Provided it doesn't interfere with the happiness of anybody else. Okay, so I can do whatever I want as long as it doesn't spoil anybody else's happiness. That's kind of the idea. All that happens simply comes about by chance. There's no life beyond the grave. Death ends everything. 
Ultimately, there's nothing to fear and nothing to hope for. Everything is the result of luck. If things are going well, you're having a lucky day. If things are not going well, you're down on your luck. Other people like that in our world that view life like that, right? They're all about happiness. And if things are not going well, well, they're down on their luck. If things are going well, well, they just got lucky. Isn't that how people talk? That's how people talk about life. A lot of people, that's their, that is their view of life. And they've not seen no eternity, nothing beyond the grave. Just, boy, I'm having a really lucky day today. Everything's going well. And so they're, they don't know it, but they're actually disciples of Epicurus. That's what they're following. And then the modern day Stoic, he believes that the affairs of this life are directed by blind, impersonal, but and, and irrational force. This often called world soul. We call it nature, the force at work in, in nature. And so the most satisfactory way to live is not to struggle against your circumstances, but to accept things the way they are. It's all a case of not so much being ruled by luck, but by cold, merciless fate. What is going to be, will be, so why worry? 1956. I wasn't alive then, just in case you think I was. <laughs> Close, but I wasn't. <laughs> but in 1956, a lady called Doris Day she was a singer, she had a very beautiful voice. And uh, she was, uh, sang a, a song that became a big hit. And it goes like this, Que sera, sera. I'm not gonna sing it, I'm just gonna tell you what it says. <laughs> que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Some of you are dying to sing it, I know, I can just see it, because you, you know this, you're going to be singing that all day long. <laughs> Sorry to inflict that upon you. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what that song is all about is this, cheerful fatalism. Whatever will be, will be. Can't do anything about it. Can't change your circumstances, can't change it. It's just the fates have determined it. Just grin and bear it, get on with it, and actually smile. <laughs> Nothing's going to change, so... And so why is that also significant to us? Well, these two systems of thought represent two alternative ideas that oppose the message of the Bible. Ways of looking at life that are not biblical at all. So, so there's really three views of way how we can look at life. One is we can believe in a personal God who is quite distinct from his creatures, yet has a personal relationship and interest in them, with them in it. On the other hand, we can look at the universe, the earth, life, and human personality, all that befalls them as one gigantic fluke. It's all down to lady look or chance. Even our very existence was a cosmic accident. Sound familiar? A lot of people believe it's just all happened by chance. Just, just so happened that the right molecules were in the right place when the explosion took place, and here we are. And third view is there's some impersonal force at work. Everything is a product of it. We might call it Mother Nature, maybe aliens that have been directing our kind of future, whatever. But it's some impersonal force that is a point. Paul is going to take to task these two false views, show their flaws, and then present the view that there is a personal God who really is directly interested in his creation. And so we want to look at this. Now, of course, um, as we read in verse 18, they want to give him an opportunity yeah, but it says certain philosophers of the Epicurean and Stoics encountered him, and, and some said, um, what will this babbler say? Others said he seems to be a set of forth of strange gods 
because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So I want to just think about how they viewed Paul to begin with. This idea of a babua, it actually comes from a bird, an old world songbird that had a long tail, short rounded wings, and a loud, discordant or musical voice. Okay, and so they said he's like that bird, just kind of chirping away, and uh, and then also it began to be known as a person who babbles, one who uh, is. Uh, it, well, the way it's used in a dictionary is this. You couldn't accuse him of being a quiet man. He's a babbler. He's always talking, talking, talking. And also, the word literally is a seed picker, like a bird picking up crumbs in the marketplace, a bit here and a bit there. And what they're kind of saying is that his philosophy is a bit of this and a bit of that. So they're kind of, kind of playing down his ideas. Others said he's a proclaimer of strange gods or foreign gods. That word gods there is the word demons again. Uh, he, he's introducing new demons, new, new uh, demonic ideas, foreign gods, insinuating Jesus and the resurrection were two additional deities that the Athenians had somehow overlooked. So, verse 19, they took him, brought him into the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So they give him this opportunity. He's in this place at Mars Hill, the Areopagus, uh, this, uh, this center of, of learning and debate. And not a trial, just simply a hearing. We want to know what, what you have to say about these strange gods. Verse 21, it says, For the Athenians and strangers which were... Uh, were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They loved the latest kind of ideas that were in the culture. Uh, it, it was kind of like TikTok of their generation, right? And they always wanted to something new, something that would give them excitement or whatever. And uh, you could say about the Athenians that they were ever living and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Always gravitating to some new idea, some new philosophy, new, some new concept, but really, never really getting there. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you were too superstitious. And that word superstitious, interesting, interesting word. Again, it really literally means the fear connected with certain types of demons. It goes back to the ancient world. And if you can see it today, you go to Southeast Asia, people are incredibly superstitious. And it's all to do with placating the gods, keeping the gods happy. We, we don't want to disturb the gods because they're going to make our life miserable. And so they'll, they'll put food out for them. They'll do all kinds of things, even though they have no appetite. They, and so it's like a superstitious it really is connected with the certain types of demons. If Paul observes this, they're, they're very superstitious people. And he says in verse 23, for as I pass by, an example of this is I, I beheld your devotions. Notice how, how devout they are. They've got so many. They, they said in Athens, actually, there were more gods than men. There were, they were, they were temples everywhere. There were different idols everywhere throughout the city. But he noticed one that had an inscription to the unknown God. Kind of interesting, isn't it, that um, Paul was very observant. He's walking around the city, but he's paying attention, and he's looking for some means that he can get the gospel in. Amen. What what can I use as a, as a means of connection to get the gospel? And so here, there's this tomb to the unknown God. And so... He says, <clears throat> who, him whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. We're going to take that point as his jumping off point to preach unto them the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Because it just shows that these pagans were trying to cover in their superstition all the bases I've got all these idols, but just in case we missed one, we better have another one to the unknown God so we got all the bases covered. 
And again, they're, they're living in superstition, fear, again, of the spirit world. And again, I just want us to get this. Sometimes I think in our Western culture, we have lost the sense of the reality of the spirit world. It is very real. And it's only the, the gospel that had, in the past, pushed back the superstition, the, the fear of the demonic, and all that kind of stuff in this culture. But as our culture becomes increasingly pagan, I'll guarantee all that stuff's going to come back again. And we're starting to see it. You see, And so uh, he, he's going to preach to them about this unknown God, the one that you ignorantly worship. By the way, uh, it's not good to worship ignorantly, is it? says to the Samaritan woman, you worship, you know not what. In other words, what you're doing, you're very devout, you're very sick, but it's ignorance. You're doing it in ignorance. He says, we know, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And what he's saying is this, salvation is by revelation. The revelation of God came through the Jewish nation, through the scriptures. We know what we worship because we're not trying to make things up as we go along. It's all by divine revelation. Our worship is a result of revelation. God revealing himself through the scriptures, through the Savior. That's how we worship. And so it's not ignorant worship, but these people were involved in ignorant worship. And so he begins to preach Christ to them. And he says this, first of all, he begins with creation. He says, God that made the world, verse 24, and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now notice, when he was in the synagogue, he always begins with the Old Testament prophet, prophetic scriptures, didn't it? He begins to take, but, but now he's dealing with people that don't know the Old Testament scriptures. So where does he begin? He begins with creation. What we call creation evangelism. He starts right in the beginning with God who made the world. He starts right there. And so he's preaching to these without an Old Testament background. And so he begins with the creation story to unfold to them the unknown God. He is that one that made the world and everything in it. And so they'd accuse him of preaching a foreign God. But if he made the world and everything that's in it, how can that God be a foreign God? If, if he made everything and every city and every nation, all created by him, how can he be a foreigner anywhere if it's his? He's no foreign God. So he's again, he's hitting at their false ideas, the attacks that are being made. This God is so immense, he says, that he cannot be contained in a temple like the many that are seen in Athens. He said, well, didn't he once dwell in a temple in Jerusalem? Well, let's just go back there. We want to just make sure we understand that <clears throat> how they understood this temple in Jerusalem. First Kings 8, Verse 27, we'll just notice a simple statement, but a powerful one, and it simply says this, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built it. They didn't think that you know, God was restricted to that temple. Heaven and heaven of heavens can't contain you. Certainly you can't just fit in this building. And so all he was saying when he got him to build this temple was that I have chosen to presence myself with the nation of Israel. But it doesn't limit him in any way. He's the God who is everywhere present. Didn't he? Don't we believe in, in his omnipresence? He's everywhere present at the same time. He cannot be limited to one building. And so again, a, a, a definite attack on the, the, the inadequacy of all these temples to really contain the greatness of the God, the unknown God, that they ignorantly will worship him. And then he says, verse 25, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. In other words, God is also self-sufficient. He's not dependent on man in any way. These, these demons, you know, they kind of bring them fruits and veggies. You don't have to bring God anything, right? 
He, he doesn't need your vegetables to be able to survive. We need his vegetables to be able to stay healthy, but he doesn't need ours, right? He, he is independent, uh, he, not dependent on man in any way. In fact, the opposite is true. We are dependent upon him. And so he says uh, that uh, <clears throat> he gives to all, again, verse 25, life and breath and all things. He doesn't need us, but we surely need him. Amen. Our breath comes as a gift from him. The very fact that your heart's ticking right now, that it's still beating, he's keeping it that way. Right? We're, we're dependent creatures. But God is not a dependent God. He doesn't need us. So in a few words, Paul has already cut at the very heart of these bankrupt philosophies. The unknown God is not a foreign God. Far from being at the mercies of chance or impersonal laws of nature, we are actually dependent on a living God and a personal God for our life and the existence. He's the one that gives life. He's the one that gives existence. By the way, he's the one that alone gives meaning to life. <laughs> and, and so he's, he's hitting at these false ideas, showing how woefully inadequate these views are. And of course, they're, they're tragic, really, aren't they? If you think about these views, it, no matter which way you look at uh, the Epicureans or the Stoics, it's still pitiful. If man's a mere product of chance, a collection and pile of atoms, nothing more and nothing less, <laughs> or were the product of blind impersonal matter worked out by blind impersonal forces. Here we are, we're just here at the end product of these, whether it's chance or whether it's fate, and then chance or fate, some virus we can't even see might enter into our bodies and then we're dead. That's it. No wonder people in our world are contemplating suicide. Isn't it a meaningless existence? If that's their philosophy is true, it holds out nothing. But instead of being a product of chance or fate, we're in fact a unique creation made by God. Amen. That gives dignity. That gives purpose. That gives meaning. That change it's a game changer to understand those things. And then verse 26, he says, He has made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. We're all descendants of the first man, Adam, and Eve, we learned about in our study on Wednesday nights, who is the mother of all living. Why is he saying this? <clears throat> He's just simply stating this. You see, the opinions were very proud. Like, we're superior because we've got such philosophy, we've got such culture, we've got such learning. We're not like the barbarians. See, they were looking down on other nations and other races. And the Athenians, we've got this marvelous culture, right? The, 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 the Greek, the culture of the Greeks. And what he's saying is, and it's a tremendous blow to their pride, uh, arrogant ways. You're all from the same stock. Can I just say this? There's absolutely no place for racism in the family of God. Amen. And in the works of God. God doesn't see it that way. We're all from one blood. We're all made of the same cookie dough, we like to say. We all come from the same parentage. And so this idea uh, of uh, racism or pride in a certain race has certainly no basis in Scripture. Made of one blood from all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he's the one who determined their times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. 
And so instead of just impersonal thoughts or chance, here's a simple thought. Actually, you where you are, because God put you there. You are who you are because God made you that way. Not tremendous to think about. There's nothing impersonal or chancy about this. You're exactly who you are, and, and you were born where God wanted you to be. He set the bounds of your habitation. That's, I think that makes such a difference. How we view life. This is who you are. This is where God made you to be. And of course, for what purpose? Verse 27, why has he put you here on the earth in the first place? He says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The reason we're here, the reason that he's been so good to the human race, providing for them and all the rest of it, etc., applying the purple force or chance, personally involved in the affairs of life, so that we might seek him. And by the way, it, it's interesting that he says that they, they, we might seek him, and, and he's not playing hide and seek. He's not trying to be hard to find. In fact, it says, we're made in a place where we are that we might seek the Lord. If happily, we might feel after him, find him, though he's not far from every one of us. The idea is this, that he, he's not trying to run away and hide. This is no game of hide and seek. God wants to be known. He wants to enjoy a relationship with his creation. He wants to be found. In fact, he's even seeking. He's seeking uh, that which is lost, right? He came to seek and to, uh, to save that which is lost. The Father's seeking worshippers. Not only is he not hiding, he's actually seeking. And so here's a God who wants to be known. Not some impersonal cause. For in him, verse 28, we live and move and have our being as certainly also your own prophets have said, for we also are his offspring. And so again, he uh, recognizes that there's a great relationship between the creator and his creation. In him, we live and move and have our being. <clears throat> and so again, we there's this perfect relationship that's there. And not only that, uh, we're also his top ring. And what he means by that is that we, we owe our very existence to the creator. We're a direct creation of God. It's not implying that we're, there's a difference between the son of God through faith and, you know, because we, we, we sometimes say we're all God's children. Well, in a certain sense, we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And we all are his creation. So we're, we, our, our existence is derived from his creative act. So in that sense, we're his offspring. And that's, that's true. Uh, and so uh, he wants us to know that, that we're a direct creation of God. And then he goes on and he says, we ought not to think, if we're the, we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead uh, is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's devices. So words, if we're made in the image and likeness of God, this idea of making gods uh, in the based on our imagination is totally contrary to the idea. Uh, how how can we make a god that we worship when we're the ones who made it? See the folly of all that. We you know and and so he's just emphasizing that the absolute folly of idolatry. These things that they've made of silver and gold in man's devisings are inferior to the men who made them. They're kind of the offspring of man's ideas. And, and so, just completely false. And so again, he's attacking all this Athenian idolatry. Verse 30, it says, the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now he commands all men to repent. So having explained the folly of idolatry, he tells us that for centuries, God has overlooked the ignorance of the Gentiles. Now, it's not that they're getting a free pass. Don't, I don't want anybody to think they're, they're getting a free pass. They're, they're still accountable. Romans 1, 18 to 10, 20 tells us people are without excuse because God has been speaking to them through creation and conscience for centuries. But now something different has happened. That means that men are definitely accountable. And they're accountable in this way because 
In the times of this ignorance, God weeped at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, wherefore he hath given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So what is this all telling us? It's telling us simply this, that you, you couldn't have a day of judgment appointed when the Lord Jesus is the judge until he came the first time. In other words, he had to come into the world as Savior before he could come into the world as judge. And so his first advent was necessary. But once he came the first time, then we can have this coming day of judgment when he will judge all men. And so he says, uh, he's commanding all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day. Uh, let's kind of start with like ver verse, isn't it? He's appointed a day on God's calendar. I don't know when the day is. You don't know when the day is. But on his calendar, there is a day settled when all men will give an account of themselves before God. And he says, not only is he appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness, but he's also appointed the judge by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore, he hath given assurance to all men that he hath raised him from the dead. And so, not only do we know that there's a day of judgment coming, we also know who the judge is going to be. Sometimes people are waiting for a trial or a court case, and they're wondering who their judge will be, because some are more lenient and some are, are, are stricter. And so they're hoping, you know, I hope my judge is going to be this person. But what we know is this. The one who will judge the world will do it in righteousness. Amen. In other words, he's not going to be easy and he's not going to be overly hard. He's actually going to be perfect to judge because he's the one who knows all men. He knows the hearts of all men. He knows what's in men. He's the perfect judge. All down pre-Christian centuries, the coming of Christ to judge the world was not imminent. He had to come and die first. But his death and glorious resurrection have changed all that. Now his second coming is not only assured, it's near. And that's why there's this urgent call for men to repent. To repent of their bankrupt philosophies. Change your mind about these false views of life. To change your mind about how you have viewed life. It's not about chance or fate. There's a real creator. And not only is he a real creator, but he's also sent his son to be the redeemer of mankind. And all men now are urged to repent, to change their minds, to realize that philosophies are false and utterly bankrupt. God is a personal creator, and every person is accountable and responsible to him. So how did these people in Athens respond? Well, in verse 32 through 34, it won't take us long, but we get three different responses. There are mockers, there are procrastinators, and there are genuine believers. And by the way, I think when any message is preached, you always get those three. The mockers, we might say, derision. They, 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 they just deride the very message. They, they're just derision. That's how they view it. And then there are pro procrastinators, and they delay making a decision. And then there are genuine, genuine believers who make the decision. And so he brings it out here. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And still there are today many who mock the idea of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And then he says, not only are those that are mockers, he says, some mocked, others said, we will hear these things again of this matter. So, they're not rejecting it outright, but they're not making a decision either. 
We'd like to hear more. We need more information. They're always wanting to hear something new. We see, so, well, maybe I need to hear some, some more. The problem with that mentality of, I just need a bit more information, is that assumes that you have more time to get more information. Mm -hmm. And it's a foolish decision. Mm -hmm. Because death, as we've often said, is the ultimate statistic. One in one dies. And God is not only appointing a day of judgment, but he's also it's appointing unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Guess who makes that appointment? Not blind in personal faith or chance. God determines not only where you live, but how long you live and when you're going to die. And so it's playing a kind of foolish game. It's like Russian roulette. I'm just going to, you know, keep pulling the trigger. Hopefully the bullet's not going to be there. And, and it's like playing that kind of game, thinking I'll put it off till tomorrow. Because we might not have just get tomorrow. And so it's always a dangerous game to be a procrastinator. <laughs> and then there are genuine believers. It says, so Paul departed from among them, how be it certain men claim unto him and believed. Praise the Lord. Among them, which were Dionysius, the Arapagate. So he, he's actually one of the, uh, the judges in the Arapagate. That He's known because of his, his position, as it were, one of the Supreme Court justices, as it were, of Athens. Uh, uh, he is one that believed. And a woman named Damaris, and others with them, we don't even know their names. But what we do know is their names are written in the book of life. Amen. We maybe won't find out till we get to glory who these others were that believed there at Athens. Thank God they believed. Their names are in that book. So, <clears throat> what has all this got to do with us? Well, of course, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. And so I think it's helpful for us to, first of all, challenge ourselves. What do we do when we see contemporary culture? Does it fascinate us or does it nauseate us? Because a lot of it is designed specifically to take people away from thinking about eternity. To waste away their days, their hours, so they don't have to think about the ultimate. And are we ever moved enough to say something? Paul is clearly moved in Athens, and he couldn't keep it to himself. So he said, i got to get out there in the marketplace of ideas and share the only message that really satisfies in giving an explanation of life. And then we might ask the question, how much have we been influenced by the philosophies of this world? I still cringe when I hear believers, and I know that they're, they're not doing it deliberately, but they'll say, <clears throat> I'm out of luck. They'll use terms like that. And, and I know, well, this is your lucky day. But it's, it's really a philosophy of life that is a false philosophy. Also, this idea of fatalism, mother nature, all these other things. It's good, isn't it, to think biblically and to speak biblically. Now we're new creatures. We need new terminology that we use that doesn't connect us with that old bankrupt philosophy that we once held on to. Leave that behind. And finally, just the idea of being a procrastinator. Maybe there are decisions, spiritual decisions, you know you need to make. Don't put them off. Respond when God speaks. I think that fear that many of us were really good at procrastinating. Procrastination is the thief of time. Problem is, we never get it back. So, we need to be those that respond to the truth. Well, our time is gone. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Father, we're, we're so thankful for the example of the Apostle Paul. 
who had such a grasp really of the, the, the philosophies of his day, but was not enamored by them. He saw through them. He saw their bankruptcy, their emptiness, and he had a much better message to preach. And we thank you that you gave him particular boldness to take every opportunity to speak to people about a satisfying worldview that does tick all the boxes that explains why we're here, what our purpose is, even how we got here, where, uh, where we've been put and placed, all of these important matters, and about the most important matter of all, that we're accountable, and that there's a day coming that we will give an account to this personal God, and therefore it behoves men to repent and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Christ Jesus came into this world, saved sinners. Now he was buried and rose again the third day, victorious. Oh, Lord, help us to be men who, and women who are captivated by that message and proclaim it often. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>